Hey guys, before we get started on this one, I just wanted to let you all know that, at least at the time of writing this, both the Metro and Stalker games are being heavily discounted over at goodoldgames.com. So if you find yourself very down with the concept of nuclear disasters in Eastern Europe, I'll have a link in the description that'll get you a solid deal. Metro 2033's release was a pretty special event in mainstream gaming. We had a crew of guys who had previously cut their teeth on the Stalker franchise looking to create roughly the same experience, except totally different. A description that would sound really stupid until you consider the fact that they accomplished that goal with flying colors. 4A games effectively put the immersive, atmospheric, and, well, Slavic nature of Eastern European first-person shooters in front of an audience that may have otherwise never been exposed to stuff like this. But that first successful entry is one thing. I mean, it certainly could have been a right time, right place type of scenario or just a really rare run of consecutively good luck. But now that the time has come to follow up the incredibly impressive Metro 2033, the question is, can these guys stick to their roots and give the world another look at the Russian nuclear apocalypse? Or would we see the prospect of even more success lead these guys into streamlining their initial approach in service of dumbing it down to a level of your typical shooter of the era? The answer to that question being, well, I guess it depends on who you're talking to. But luckily, you are talking to me, at least for the next hour or so, so what do you say we get right into it? Stalkers, welcome to the Metro. It's no secret Metro 2033 did incredibly well for itself, even more so when you factor in the relatively small size of 4A games at the time and the fact that this was their first public project. But at the time of Metro Last Light's development, the small motley crew that was 4A grew to a team of 80 plus members, and while I don't have any hard numbers based on previous performance, I don't think it's too big of a stretch to assume they were now working with a lot more money from the game's publisher Deep Silver. And at this point, those of us who played and loved 2033 at launch found ourselves with some conflicting feelings. Because on one hand, a small development house made up of ex-stalker devs had just won the slob jank lottery with a big mainstream hit. However, on the other hand, the pressure for these guys to conform to what you could call the standard shooter template at the time must have been pretty strong. After all, the more you spend on developing a video game, the more it has to make back in order for that work to have been considered a success. So it's not an exaggeration to say that a lot of us were either expecting to love this sequel or absolutely hate it. One clear sign early on that things might be shifting more towards that latter option was the fact that 4A had declared this entry would deviate from the first game's story approach. Instead of following the literary events of Dmitry Glukovsky's own Metro 2034, 4A decided to create their own storyline that would act more as a continuation of the first game's story. And from afar, this does seem like a pretty bad move. A lot of us thought that original story from Glukovsky is one of the bigger factors that made 2033's game adaptation so unique and interesting. The idea of giving up on that model just one entry in can seem like a pretty big leap and a possible step towards the streamlining I was talking about earlier. After reading 2034 for myself though, I can say this was probably a solid idea. Not to insult the book or anything, I mean it was an amazing read, but there's just a lot about Metro 2034 that could not have made a successful transition into the medium of video games, or at the very least, first person shooters. Not only was RTM no longer the main character, but it has a split cast that sort of shared the narrative. On top of that, it deals more with philosophical issues and the concept of preserving history in a world that's close to losing it than it does firefights with hordes of mutants. And I'm definitely not saying a video game can't successfully tackle more deep and important subject matter than a firefight between two opposing forces, but maybe a linear, action-packed, first-person shooter would be a bad fit. Trust me, the concept of exploring the morality of culling a large amount of people in a world where people are a rarity to save others from an infectious disease is not only, well, eerily poignant right now, but also would make for an incredible video game story. I just don't think Metro as we knew it at the time was the right canvas to paint that picture on. 
so Foray decided instead to follow up on the bad ending of their adaptation of 2033, creating sort of a split in the fan base. Some were really excited to see they would have another chance to take up the role of Artyom and see what further nonsense could go down in a world where giant alien looking creatures could mind kill people just by talking to them. At the same time, others feared that Glukowski's creative storytelling not being present might be like removing a core pillar from the Metro experience and maybe the whole damn thing become crumbling down. And if we're being totally honest, both sides may have been half right on that one. So with that, I would love to start talking story, but before we do, I have to address something. Mostly the stretched picture you're looking at right now. A whole lot of you noticed this in the last video and were not shy about letting me know about it. Now, I do address that issue in the video, but I wouldn't blame any of you for not making it 40 minutes into content that seems like it was rendered out at a weird aspect ratio. And in the spirit of not making the same mistake twice, I'll go ahead and cover it in the beginning of this video because the problem still persists. So if aspect ratios and resolutions don't really interest you too much, I'll have the chapters set up in the play bar there, or you could click the link in the description to skip past this stuff. <laughs> She's got the slot for those. So, the basic summary is, the Metro series on PC seems to act very weird when you have an ultra-wide monitor plugged in. Oh, and for those of you who hilariously thought a guy who is obsessed with video output somehow accidentally recorded, analyzed, edited, and rendered out a video made up of ultra-wide resolution footage without knowing it, obviously no, that did not happen. Across my recording sessions with 2033, Last Light, and both their Redux iterations, I had the in-game resolution set to 2560 by 1440, a proper 16 by 9 aspect ratio. But for some reason, they seemed to display at a 21 by 9 image smashed into a 16 by 9 frame. Now I know what you're thinking, and yes, I made sure I set my graphics card not to scale any images it outputs, and unrelated, but I did have my monitor set up in a similar pixel by pixel display mode, but for some reason I really can't explain, the game just really wants to render out at the native aspect ratio of my monitor no matter what I tell it. I've tried setting my desktop resolution to 1440p in Windows, and the game still stretches itself vertically, so consider this me throwing in the towel. I've tried every in-game resolution, patch, and I&I and I edit I could get my hands on, and I just could not find a solution. So most of the footage you'll see here today will look sort of off as a result. I apologize for that, but there doesn't seem to be much I can do. I will talk about this problem later when we cover the presentation side of things, but for the time being, one, yes, I know it looks bad. Two, no, I can't do anything to fix it without losing visual information on the sides. And three, if you know anything that might shed some light on this issue, please feel free to clue me in. Hey guys, Future Jared here. So about 85% of the way through with the editing process, I decided to stretch my captured footage instead of just leaving it squished like this. Luckily, Last Light doesn't seem to keep its HUD elements or subtitles close to the sides of the screen like 2033 did, so it looks like I should be able to get away with messing with the picture without losing any important details. I am still going to talk about this problem further on in the timeline, and I will provide examples then, but other than that, this video should be a lot easier on the eyes now. Okay, back to past Jared. <sighs> okay, that went a little longer than planned, but we are finished with all the prerequisites, so how about that story? Inside, move! Metro 2034 sees you back in the shoes of the Metro's savior and owner of one hell of a guilty conscience, Artyom. One year has passed since the end of 2033, and thanks to his heroism in the face of the Dark Ones, Artyom has been accepted into the Rangers, a neutral peacekeeping force dedicated to keeping the residents of the Metro from killing each other. Oh, and here's something interesting to probably me and me alone. From the start, Foray, either due to some translation or creative decision, changed the book Spartans to the Rangers, and that always kind of bothered me. Not enough to really get upset about, but enough for it to nag at me. Well, in Last Light, they sort of broached that subject by making the Rangers be short for the Rangers of the Sparta Order. Now, I'm not sure if that was something that was explained in the first game and I just missed it, but either way, I thought it was cool. So in the last year, the Rangers, or Spartans, or whatever you want to call them, have made a nice little base of operations out of the D6 military facility we cleared out in the last game. This base was filled with all kinds of weapons and gear, and thanks to that, the Rangers have become a much more imposing threat to the communist and Nazi forces of the Metro. The game proper starts with Artyom being awakened by his old pal Khan. 
And before we go forward, for those of you who haven't played 2033 yet, I'm just going to be really honest. Vaguely talking about this game's story is going to totally spoil the ending of the last one, and I really don't want to do that to you. So either click the next chapter in the YouTube play bar or skip this section with one of the timestamps in the description because just about everything I say from here on out should be considered a spoiler for the first Metro. Cool? Alright. Let's get our asses out of this place, then we'll go our separate ways. Huh? So Khan comes to Artyom with the news that he spotted a dark one on the surface, something that wouldn't be quite so interesting if we hadn't have personally witnessed several nukes rain hot radiation down on them in the last game. Going off the bad ending in said previous game, Artyom for the last year has felt a deep guilt for what he did that day and often considers the possibility that these things were only looking to communicate with humanity and not destroy it. Khan is a firm believer in this line of reasoning and figures this one being left alive might be some kind of cosmic last chance at salvation. Artyom, it's your last chance for forgiveness, for getting rid of the nightmares! Basically, this thing is humankind's best shot at any kind of a long-term future as far as he sees it. So he and Artyom let the ranger's commander know what's up and he makes the pretty predictable move of ordering them to kill it. To make sure the job gets done, he sends his daughter Anna to accompany you and she is just... a real fucking peach. I wish I had been up in that tower myself to see the missiles fall and watch them burn in their nests. Out on the surface, I was happy to find the seemingly eternal blizzard has subsided a bit and in some spots you can even see the sun. Oh, also the last loving dark one is a cute little kid. Anna tries smoking this thing but misses, leading to a chase and eventual capture of both Artyom and the dark one by Nazis who treat both of them about as well as you would expect Nazis to treat anyone. Ah, congratulations! You're a mutant! No, no, please! <laughs> So you and a captured soldier from the communist red line join forces and orchestrate an escape. Our new Stalin loving friend Pavel says he'll use his connections to get a safe passage through the red line so we can get back to the D6 and I'll say this right now, it is going to be incredibly hard for me to continue talking about the rest of this game's story without spoiling a pretty big twist that happens early on in the game. Any sort of critique or praise after this point has a good chance of involving this twist and the nature of it sort of colors literally everything that happens in the story from here on out. So going forward, instead of marking one section of this discussion as spoilers and then dancing around those spoilers afterwards like I normally do, I'm just going to ask first timers to skip the entire story section by heading to the timestamp on screen or using the YouTube chapters down in the play bar. I really do hate to gate so much of this part of the video behind a spoiler warning, but I'm not sure I'd be able to say anything meaningful about this story without really messing things up for people looking to play Last Light for the first time. So if that's you, do me a favor and skip this part and we'll all meet back up with each other in the gameplay section. Alright, so we finally make our way to a red station and Pavel reveals that he's actually a high ranking officer in the red army. He says his higher ups are interested in Artyom since he could give them vital info on how the reds could get their hands on the D6 facility and the baby dark one. And these guys go about getting that information from him in a way very befitting of a bunch of communists. Oh, fuck. Still nothing, huh? But their leader's edgy teenage son lets you escape in defiance of his dad's cruelty. As Artyom sneaks out of the base, he's able to catch a few candid conversations. It seems like the guy in charge of the Reds got his seat by assassinating his brother and it was his head of intelligence that got the job done. So now this greasy General Corbett acts as a sort of shadow leader of the Red Line by manipulating the real one. I typically love me a good military intrigue type of story and this one section showing the corrupt underbelly of the Red Line's leadership really got me excited for what was to come and that's not even taken into account how much I enjoyed the direction they were taking with Pavel. As the story continues and you progress even closer to linking up with the Rangers, Pavel becomes your sort of de facto antagonist. You're always looking to head him off at the pass and personal encounters with the guy have a very arch nemesis feel to them. Even when we're shooting at each other, he'll still share little inside jokes and seems to be generally happy to be around you. 
Hey, 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 steady, steady, steady now. All right, all right, you're on top, D'Artagnan, you're on top. He's just also totally willing to put a bullet in your head for the advancement of this new branch of communism. Come on, get your ass out here, you fucking commie rat. Anyways, we find out that Corbett's looking to take the D6 for the Reds so they can rule the Metro and Artyom starts the process of getting to them first, which he does eventually accomplish and what comes next was a cool little surprise. Artyom links back up with the Rangers and Anna seems to have really warmed up to him in his absence. But I, well... I felt it was you. But before anyone gets a chance to formulate a plan, there's this big explosion, and well, to explain this, we're gonna need to go back to the start. As you're walking around D6, in the very beginning of the game, you keep hearing about this Lesnitsky guy who up and left his post without a word. Have you heard about Lesnitsky? Yeah. What are you talking about? Here. Check with the guards at the lab. Everyone seems to be talking about it, but it's in a way that feels sort of natural and subtle. Not too on the nose. Then when RTM gets captured by the Reds, we see the missing ranger was actually a Red spy who left with valuable knowledge on how the rangers operate and stole some kind of bioweapon on his way out. Now the surprise wasn't that Lesnitsky was a spy, that gets said out loud in a cutscene, but after that I sort of figured that they were through with the guy. When he showed back up, it dawned on me that the potential knowledge of his betrayal probably hadn't even left the room that cutscene took place in yet. Wait a minute. Could it be Lesnitsky? So Lesnitsky was able to worm his way into a role kind of competing with Pavel as the guy you love to hate in this story. After surviving the surprise attack and seeing Anna captured, we catch wind of a backup plan in the works. It seems like Corbett is looking to use a stolen modified Ebola virus as a sort of nuclear deterrent once they've taken the D6. Now this was a great little nod to the book, which had a very similar threat to viral outbreak kind of storyline. What really sold me was this one cool scene where RTM just happens upon an entire ass station that the red line purposely infects with their virus so they could come in and quote unquote cleanse the outbreak. Which amounts to killing everyone in the station and burning them all to ash. Again, a cool nod to the book. Intruders! After making it through that literal hell with Anna in hand, the two make it to Hansa station where they link up with Khan who says now more than ever the Dark One is their last chance. He leads us to a body of water that I assume is some kind of anomaly. He says that if we get in with the Dark One on our mind we'll be able to see where he is and well that's exactly what goes down. Along with the Dark One's location we get this cool little chunk of added clarification on a plot point from the first game. In 2033, Artyom's targeted by the Dark Ones because for some reason he's the most responsive to their specific type of communication and that's always kind of left as a chosen one plotline. Which isn't really a bad thing narratively speaking, but it was left relatively open-ended. We never really got an answer for why. Well, after taking a dip in this magical pool, Artyom finds out there's a pretty good reason for that. It turns out a very young Artyom and his friends sort of set into motion the events of 2033 when they snuck out of the metro and accidentally ran into a pack of mutants and were subsequently saved by a dark one. That interaction apparently making Artyom able to hear them in his head. Now I don't know about you, but personally I would have been fine if this was never explained and it was just sort of left open ended, but now that we have an answer for it, I kind of appreciate it. Nowadays retconning does have a very bad name attached to it, but when used right, like this, it can really help retroactively improve a story, and I think that's exactly what we're looking at here. I'm all alone now. You're not alone. You're the first. So anyways, this river of truth dumps us out pretty close to a big train being used by the Reds to transport the Dark One. After a cool little on-rails section, Artyom makes his way onto the train, absolutely obliterates it, and rescues the little baby Dark One, who then decides to find some human clothes because he wants to look like you, which is just... I want to. Like you. Too damn adorable to even address. Artyom and the Dark One form this cute bond and from here on out work as a precious little buddy cop team. So Russian Murtaugh and Riggs over here eventually make their way to a peace agreement taking place in Polis. All of the Metro's major players are present including the Reich and the Red Line. Just before getting there, the Dark One uses his telepathic abilities on Pavel and Lesnitsky, discovering a plan to use the peace talks as a distraction to mask their campaign to take over D6. 
The little guy forces Moskvin, the leader of the Red Line, to publicly admit to not only the dirty deed that saw him rise to power, but the whole taking over the Rangers' base plan. He's storming the D6 now! And there's that virus! And if that falls into Corbett's hands, the end! This finally gets everyone up to speed, and the Rangers rally together for one last stand against the Reds, and this is one hell of a climax. The fight feels desperate and chaotic, and by the end, the communists seem to have the upper hand, which is where the hidden morality system from 2033 comes into play. There are two possible endings to get here. One where RTM sees that the Reds will soon have control of D6 and mass amounts of the virus they're looking to unleash on the Metro, and decides to kill everyone to keep the rest of humanity from blinking out of existence. This segment ends with Anna explaining to your children how brave you were and how much good you did. And I guess it's a good thing I really like this conclusion because it's the only ending I can seem to get every time I replay this game. I do all the good deeds I could think of and spare both Pavel and Lesnitsky, but for some reason I always get the bad ending. But I guess if you have to get a bad ending, this is a really cool one to end up with. I love the idea that Artyom in desperation decided to take out both sides to make sure this kind of power doesn't fall into the wrong hands. It doesn't exactly jive with canon as there is a sequel to this game where you play as Artyom again, but not a bad ending to get if you ask me. If you've managed to rack up a whole lot of points with a morality system, basically those same events play out, but just before you're able to activate the self-destruct system, a group of Dark Ones show up with your little buddy. Apparently, they came from a secret chamber within D6, confirming rumors in the first game that the Dark Ones were either a creation of the Russian government or something they were experimenting on just before the bombs dropped. This group of evolved beings leave the Metro in the final scene, but promise to come back one day and help humanity rebuild. A pretty damn inspiring end sequence when you take into account how drab things have been so far. So I'd say no matter what ending you get, you'll have a damn awesome resolution to what was in my opinion a great story. Last Light deals with a lot of the aspects of 2033 that I really wanted to see expanded on. I mean sure it's awesome just to mention that there are Nazis and communists warring deep underground in Moscow's metro system, but I wanted to see that in action. I wanted to see how the politics of all of this would play out and that's exactly what Last Light gave me. I'm from the Red Line. Uh, our superiors are not on the best of terms, huh? But I say fuck that. Unlike a lot of people, I really, really enjoyed Metro 2033 as a book, but I totally get why the developers feared they wouldn't be able to squeeze a video game story out of it. Given that they deviated really hard from the source material that was, at least in part, responsible for their initial success, it's easy to be a little apprehensive about Last Light's story experience, but I really think they managed to write something that was not only fun and interesting, but fit in with the Metro universe really well. Honestly, if I never knew this game wrote its own narrative, I would have assumed this was also based directly on a book like its predecessor, which is a big compliment considering how good that book series is. Going back to the comments in my first video on this series, it seems like a lot of franchise vets aren't fond of the Dark One plots found in both the books and the games, saying they added a little too much sci-fi to what was otherwise relatively believable. And I do see where you guys are coming from there, but at least to me, they feel right for this world. After all, we have train tunnels here infested with poltergeist and mutants running around that somehow rapidly evolved faster than anything that has ever existed on this planet. So it's not too far of a stretch to think evolved humans with psychic abilities, or aliens for that matter, are also out there somewhere. That being said, there are a few issues I noticed here. First off, the love interest plot with Anna feels like we skipped a bunch of development and ended up at the end of its arc, the literal next time we see her after the game's opening. She hated Artyom when the game first started and didn't let a single solitary second go by without letting him know that, but after finding out he survived being captured, she all of a sudden develops this magnetic attraction to the guy. I don't know, it just felt very rushed for me. And I'm not saying this plotline can't be done well, I just don't think they did it particularly well. If you ask me, the team handled this way better in the next game in the series, but as far as this title goes, they could have used a few extra scenes in between I Hate Artyom Anna and I Can't Wait to Jump Artyom's Heavily Radioactive Bones Anna. So, what are you waiting for? Come along, rabbit. And my second, and well last complaint, is the story's progression. 
In 2033, you had a relatively simple goal. Get to the Rangers and let them know what's happening in exhibition. After that gets settled, the last leg of the game is spent completing yet another singular goal, one that was still poignant to the previous one. In Last Light, there are all these side narratives to follow. The corruption in the upper ranks of the Reds, the Nazis purging mutations, Anna and Artyom's romance, Lesnitsky's betrayal, and the rivalry between Pavel. Now, I'm not complaining about there being a wealth of story content, I really get into every plot point I just listed, but they feel too rapid fire to me. I mean, think about it this way, Last Light only takes maybe half an hour longer on average to complete than the last game, but somehow includes more than three times the story. And I guess I just find myself wishing I could have had a significantly larger package to fit all these cool ideas into, or at the very least, they could have focused on maybe one or two of these plot points. Now this isn't something that's going to ruin your playthrough, they are still cool ideas and nearly each one gets resolved to a satisfying degree but no one plot element gets the attention it deserves in my opinion. Either a longer game or cutting out some story beats for a future entry would have been nice but as far as complaints go you gotta admit this one is pretty mild. Yes I definitely think it could have been handled more optimally but for a situation like this I think it's a lot better than anyone could have hoped for. I mean, these guys went in and made changes to a pretty core pillar in the Metro experience and somehow didn't bring the whole house of cards down around their heads. Something that deserves a lot of praise. There were DLC campaigns released afterwards and the Redux version comes with all of them for free. The story-based stuff was actually pretty cool, especially Khan's little side story, but overall, I wouldn't say these short tales are a significant portion of Metro Last Light's narrative experience. A nice extra, though. It seems clear to me these guys love this world and aimed to write something that respected the source material, and if my only complaint is that they added too many details, I think we're off to a good start with this one. As far as stories go, you really couldn't ask for a better follow-up to 2033, something that's made evident when a lot of the fanbase actually prefer this game's events to what was actually written in Glukowski's own literary sequel to that original showing. And as you know, it is very rare for a video game adaptation to supplant its own source material in the fans' eyes. So yeah, overall, Last Light is a great ramping up of the stakes set by 2033. It's action-packed and maybe a little too fast for its own good, but it's an amazing time regardless. Besides, it perfectly serves its chief purpose in the eyes of Metro fans, and that's just given us a little more time in the dingy, depressing, and enthralling world of the Russian Metro. Like I mentioned before, the heat was most certainly on for Last Light's development. Investors were expecting a return on their financial backing, and fans were expecting something true to the brand that Metro had earned itself in its first showing. Of course, it didn't help that this game was being worked on during one of the most prolific times this industry has ever seen regarding first-person shooters, yes, including the whole Doom phase. And sadly, the accepted method of the day was for developers to increasingly copy each other's work till a good number of releases in the genre morphed into this large, nondescript blob. And in the spirit of not stringing you guys along, Long, yes, I do think some Call of Duty DNA worked its way into the design of Metro Last Light. Now, it wasn't in a gratuitous type of way. I mean, the shooting mechanics, stealth focus, and heavy emphasis on meaningful storytelling were still very much Metro, but elements like pacing and set pieces seemed to really borrow from the general FPS zeitgeist of the day. Or at least it seems that way to me, and subsequently a lot of Metro fans, but here's where I fall out of favor with those fans. See, I'm not necessarily against that idea. I know, I know, what a filthy casual. But before we get into that, let's go over the basics. Stay down, or your brain goes splat. Metro Last Light, the OG non-redux release, in the more meaningful way, still operates just like you're used to if you're coming straight from its prequel. The game still leads you around by the nose in a linear fashion while you spend your time either exploring your environment, sneaking around guards in stealth sections, or shooting hot lead in the general direction of your enemy. Once again, you're going to spend a good chunk of your time following behind an NPC while they speak that oh-so-familiar language, expository flavor text, and I'm going to say just like last time, even though I know this is not something traditionally that's very well regarded in the gaming industry, I kind of like it here. 
Sure, it's a relatively lazy, if not well-worn path to getting some world building done without treating the player like an idiot or breaking the fourth wall, but I don't know, it kind of works here. Just like before, interactivity with your gear is a major player in my enjoyment, and even some of the features I loved about 2033 Redux ended up coming from this release. For example, using a lighter to burn spider webs or wiping your gas mask to clear it of gunk. Two elements that are absolutely 100% not necessary for anyone to utilize while playing the game, but still I can't stop myself from doing both. I said it in my last video, and I'll say it again, stuff like this is always a welcome sight for me. I mean, I love the idea of increasing my ability to meaningfully engage with the game world around me vis-a-vis -vis the environment, but letting me manipulate the gear that's in my possession in new and interesting ways is always going to get a thumbs up for me. For example, needing to exchange gas masks with corpses if yours gets damaged in a fight, needing to recharge your batteries for a flashlight, or pumping pneumatic weapons. All of these things really do a lot to immerse me into a game. Most developers would have a lot of these processes handled through simple commands or menus, but here in Metro, these things are handled manually by the player. I know it sounds like such a small artifact buried under a mountain of more obvious details to talk about as far as this game goes, but for some reason this has always been an obsession of mine. Ideally, all of us are just looking for our own subjective combination of realism versus fantasy elements, and for me, I don't know why, but something like manually selecting a fire mode on a gun in-game or cleaning something to make it work just really helps immerse me into an environment. Continuing with the additions, Last Light added a nearly limitless number of quality of life changes over its vanilla 2033 counterpart. Features that would be a lot more impressive if most of us hadn't already played 2033 Redux, which was basically all of Last Light's innovations inside of its predecessor's shell. Throwing knives can now be used alongside your normal weapons as a throwable instead of having to equip them and them alone, and Artyom's watch that lets him know if he's visible or not was changed from a very messy three light system to a simple light on if you can be seen and off if you can't one. One great addition was that unarmed takedowns are now performable, and really there's an entire video's worth of other changes to cover here. Like I said, I don't need to talk about them in depth, since the Redux games would see them become the standard, and basically everything I said in my last video still applies, but suffice it to say, Metro Last Light was nothing but an improvement over the pure mechanical aspects of 2033's gameplay. How it handled other aspects, though, well, that's a different, less positive story. One thing that was an absolute gut punch to see was that the Ranger and Ranger Hardcore difficulties were now locked behind a paywall, something that nearly the entire fanbase was up in arms about. Even people not interested in using those difficulties were upset something that used to be free was now being leveraged as an extra cost. Needless to say, this was a fucking moronic move, but sadly not one that would look out of place in the generation Last Light was released in. As I remember it, 2013 was roundabout when devs figured out how much extra money they could make if they chopped up their once whole content and served it up to gamers piecemeal at a small price per transaction. Now given hindsight and the average human ability to use common sense, we can see the clear and obvious fact that this method, while incredibly profitable in the short term, overall lowers customer brand loyalty, ensuring that you would spend all of those ill-begotten gains on surviving the nuclear winter that would be your sales further on down the line. Luckily, a lot of us voted with our wallets during this period, and recently we've seen bad DLC practices like this kept in far greater check than before something made very evident when the Ranger difficulties were added back in free of charge for the Redux release. If I had to put a bow on it, I would say Last Light feels much more forgiving and maybe accommodating than 2033 did, which is sort of a lot of people's issue. I think given the time we were living in and past experience with developers dumbing down their products for the lowest common denominator, it would be kind of easy to see the general gameplay evolutions and tweaks gained from having a full release under Foray's belt as an attempt at getting more customers at the cost of sacrificing the experience fans already loved. And if it's not clear, I don't necessarily think that's what's happening here. Hey. Now sure, this most definitely does happen in the industry, and often. I mean, look at the FF7 remake. You could love that game, hate it, or fall in the middle, but I don't think you could point to a single aspect of it which expanded on something introduced in the original. But I truly don't think that's what we're looking at with Last Light. 
I get the genuine feeling these moves were made to refine the product in a way which would still be true to that metro feeling they cultivated with their first project. At least in my eye, 99% of the changes here were made to mechanics or features that might have worked before but maybe in a diminished capacity. There were definitely tweaks made that you could argue were intended to dumb the game down, but each one of those few times it seems like something was added to compensate for that. For example, to me it feels like it's a little harder to get caught in stealth sections. I can stand right up in front of enemies and the time it takes for them to yell out or sound an alarm seems to have increased pretty substantially, and yeah that does sound like a cop out if you look at it in a vacuum, but I think there's more to consider here. Mostly the fact that stealth sections in this game are much, much longer than those seen in 2033. These stealth missions can take place over an entire building with each room offering a nuanced twist to the challenge. And yeah, you could point to areas in 2033 that shared at least a similar size, but you gotta keep in mind those were endgame challenges designed to test all you've learned over the course of the campaign. In Last Light, your first non-tutorial stealth mission takes place in four or five massive rooms stuffed to the brim with patrolling guards, and the amount of light flooding in makes it hard to find a good hiding spot without making a first pass and snuffing out any of the light sources you can get to. Honestly, the only balance adjustment I can think of that isn't accompanied by some kind of counterbalance is the fact that mutants now take far less damage to put down on higher difficulties. They can still spawn in directly behind you and lock you into a four-hit combo which will likely kill kill you before you've even seen them, but now you can create some distance and drop a few without using a quarter of your ammunition. And if you'll remember, this was a specific gripe of mine with both 2033 and Redux. See, I'm fine with dying to just a few hits, but you gotta at least put me on somewhat of an even playing ground. So I guess cheers to 4A. Even if you guys were looking to dumb the game down, it ended up working out in my favor at least. Of course, we absolutely have to talk about the one issue most people had when this game launched and the one you've likely wondered why I haven't covered yet. It's more set-piece driven, action-packed nature. Like I said before, a lot of us were worried that 4A would cave to the temptation of making truckloads of money by transforming the slow-paced, atmospheric shooter they were working with before into a clone of the single-player Call of Duty craze. And after having played this game all the way through at least five times, I can confirm we were right. Or at least half right. There's no doubt the general pace of this game was dramatically increased, with more atmospheric world-building sections getting less and less screen time to make way for the metro equivalent of a turret section. And on top of that, some actual turret sections. There's the shootout with the guards on a moving train, desperately holding out against Nosalises while a boat slowly comes to rescue you, the big chase and subsequent escape from the Reich. There are a lot of action-packed, pulse-pounding, and sort of contrived set pieces in this game, and it's hard to finish playing it without getting the impression that this was what they focused on most during development. And if we're being honest, it would be naive to not assume some of that was due to wanting at least a portion of that cod pie, but I have two things to say about that. First and most subjectively, it's not so much of an issue for me because I actually enjoyed these high octane set pieces, but more importantly I think there might be an alternative explanation that we're not really thinking about. The last game in the franchise and chief frame of reference when criticizing Last Light had the benefit of using the book Metro 2033 as a roadmap for how the game should flow. Events were pretty true to the source material when going from game to book and maybe that helped control the pace of the game. And if that is indeed the case, maybe now that 4A didn't have a book to map out its progression, we're just seeing the kind of game the developers wanted to make in the first place. Sure, some of this may have been inspired by what was popular at the time, but instead of being profit-driven, perhaps these guys made a game like this because those were the games they and really all of us were playing at the time. It is certainly possible that I'm wrong here or that the real answer lies somewhere in between these two options, but I'd like to at least give a team who's wowed me before the benefit of the doubt. And now that all my goodwill's been used up, one thing I can definitely say was a clear downgrade from 2033 is Last Light's new insistence on including boss fights. Sure, 2033 did have a few big bad mutants you could theoretically tangle with, but the cool part about the demons or librarians is that they were essentially invincible as far as you were concerned. In Last Light, that is very much not the case, and even though these fights can be pretty fun and can be cheesed with the right combination of luck and strategy, they just feel out of place in this world. 
Metro 2033 set up this idea that there are some post-apocalyptic threats that are so dangerous not even Russians drunk on mushroom vodka and armed to the teeth would mess with them, and that felt right for the type of game that it was. With Last Light playing so much like its predecessor, moments like this just don't fit in the right way. Like I said, they are mechanically well done and serve their pulse-increasing purpose well, but maybe they just don't fit into a Metro game quite as well as the devs would have liked. This is sort of an issue, but it does get evened out by the fact that the game focuses way harder on stealth sections this time around. In the original, gameplay was almost evenly broken up between station, topside, and stealth sections, but here in Last Light, that balance is way off. In a good way, though. You don't really go to the surface all that often, and while the big shootouts are still here, most of your interactions with the game will be with the crouch button pressed down, and in my opinion, that's awesome. Because for whatever reason, I've always really enjoyed Metro's specific brand of more forgiving stealth mechanics. Sure can feel a little limited without being able to hide or move bodies, and enemy AI isn't all that bright, but it works really well and made me feel a lot more skilled than I actually am. So if you ask me, they did a great job of evening things out here. I mean, sure, they do have a lot more action, but it's balanced against a lot more slow-moving stealth, which to me is a nice trade-off to have. Which is exactly why I think Last Light is a very clear improvement over the systems and mechanics that 2033 introduced, and as a sequel, you really can't hope for anything better than that. You could most definitely make an argument for things feeling very different in terms of the game's events and how they're paced, but all of the mechanical elements in play in 2033 are here and polished really well. Which is exactly why it's crazy we would eventually get an improved version of this phenomena in the form of a redux release of Last Light. What? You got a better idea? You brought this ape here! Last Light Redux goes in and makes just a few small tweaks to the base game, and in my opinion, these are all great additions. For example, the keys that could be found in each area, which unlocks a safe that's also hidden somewhere in that zone. This was a great little adjustment to make for people like me who love exploring these gorgeous environments, but are also looking for some kind of reward for my time invested. On top of that, there were purely graphical changes made, like RTM's watch, for example. Another move that I think was for the better. Don't get me wrong, this thing looks dope as hell in a steampunk sort of way, but it can be hard to read at a glance, where the new one doesn't give me as many issues. To be honest, there are far few alterations or additions to note compared to 2033 Redux and the difficulty hasn't had any kind of tweaks from what I can tell. On a real big plus though, new more awesome weapons are now available and you can try them out in the very first area so you don't have to wait till the end game to find out what a belt fed shotgun feels like to shoot. And just in case you had any questions, it is fucking awesome. It feels like Last Light required a lot less work to remaster than 2033 since a lot of the changes made in that game were inspired by Last Light itself. There are some small parts that might have been touched up here or there, but overall this is far less of a radical change from its original form than what you'll find when playing 2033 and Redux back to back. And since they're so similar, let's go ahead and just talk about their gameplay as a package deal, which will be a very short conversation because it's really good. It is of course true that you're going to lose at least a small portion of that dark, slow-paced, interesting, subdued feeling that 2033 was so good at radiating, which I think is unavoidable in a situation like this. Now that the studio had solid financial backing and a dedicated group of fans behind it, they would of course look to blow every player's mind as often as possible. Essentially, these guys just wanted to give us 2033, but better. And sure, profit was definitely a factor in that decision, but I get the feeling this was done in a look at all the cool stuff we can do now kind of way and not a please God buy this video game one. It is noticeably different than its predecessor when you get really deep into analyzing it, but I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. It is still very undoubtedly a Metro game and the world and mechanics you loved before are all still here. There may be different portions of all those elements than you're used to, but the ingredients are all present. Really, the general mechanics here are amazing. The movement, combat, sneaking, and exploration are all top-notch, polished, and engaging. You might be understandably worried about its fast pace and overall formatting, but I assure you the glue that holds this thing together is just as strong as ever. It's an incredibly fun playthrough, one that should not only enthrall past fans, but people a little more used to your more traditional mainstream FPS experience. 
It may seem almost significantly different at first, but as we'll see as the series continues, each entry seems to have its own feel, meaning no single Metro game is going to play exactly like another as far as specifics go. But the good news is, no matter how similar or different one entry in the series may feel from the other, all three Metro games are well worth playing and Last Light is very much included. <laughs> Graphically, Last Light's in a weird position as far as I'm concerned. I mean, it's definitely a more refined look than what we saw in 2033 and benefits from a much bigger group of people working on it this time around. Everywhere you look, there's a lot more detail to look at, even if it's just trash piled up in a corner or a few more shanties erected in some dark station somewhere. There are signs everywhere that Foray had a lot more resources at their disposal for this game's development, and I know this is going to sound crazy, but it just does not impress me quite as much as 2033 did at launch. And I think there might be a few reasons for that. On one end, we've all been looking at the Redux version of both games for years, which sort of equalizes the visual experience between the two. But on a more pretentious level, part of what impressed me so much with 2033 was how much they accomplished with so little backing. 4A was a small developer after all, who had just got done giving their old bosses the finger. That first showing really made an impact, and I think a bit of that comes from their humble beginnings. By the time Last Light was released, they were pretty comparable to your average AAA dev house, and for the most insane reason, I think that takes away a tiny bit of the charm for me. Plus, 2033 cemented the look and feel of this world, while Last Light just sort of refined it. Of course, these are just small observations, so buried in the realm of subjectivity that it's not really worth considering, so don't take this as a negative, but more like a dumb observation. On the plus side though, there is a lot to love about Last Light's look. Mostly the fact that so much of 2033's visual identity is present here, with the added benefit of small aesthetic changes. The lighting is nowhere near that hardline, dynamic, early PC look that was such a big feather in 2033's cap, but smaller effects like light halos, chromatic aberrations, and faux refractions from condensation and water droplets on your mask are very nice to see. Like I said in my last video, from the first game to the second, 4A had adopted a newer, more console-centric approach to lighting, which does leave a lot of areas a little more flatly lit than comparable spots in its predecessor. The good news being, this is far less of an issue than it was in 2033 Redux. Mostly since that was a result of implementing a new lighting system into a game that already existed where Last Light was built from the ground up around it. The sections that take place on the surface are much better looking now, and even though they're still very linear, there's a little more room to play around with, which leads me to feeling like I stumbled on the right way to go instead of the game just outright leading me there. Fire seems to be a new tool in 4A's belt, and you get the feeling that they really like the way their specific brand of video game fire looks because it's in use all over the place in Last Light. And it is actually really impressive. At one point when I was fighting Pavel, I tossed a grenade and I knocked over some kind of a table that had a candle on it, and it lit the table on fire. Now, I'm not sure if the rest of the game has a dynamic, flammable system going on or if it was just this one scene, but either way, it was really cool. The rubbery, sort of funny looking, lifeless facial animations that could be found in 2033 have been further worked on and while they still don't look amazing, it's a definite improvement in my eyes. <laughs> One thing that really stood out to me a few hours in is the emphasis on showing a lot of NPCs on screen whenever possible, something that is still very impressive today. At the time this game first launched, I was rocking hardware nowhere near what was needed to max any settings out, and even then I was surprised at how well the game ran in those scenes. Of course, the frame rate would definitely dip, but I would get similar dips in a single empty tunnel with some dynamic light sources in 2033. Now that I have a PC that can run circles around this game, I can't really say how well or poorly optimized Last Light is, but I have to imagine even lower end current gen cards will be able to get a locked 60 FPS at 1080p. Animations are just as stunning here as they were in the last game, and it looks like there are a few more pre-baked death animations, which is always good.
The mutants you run into still flow and move in the most fluid way, and the odd blurred, interpolated frames I found in 2033 seem to have been dealt with as well. Really, if you were to call Last Light just a better looking 2033, you would mostly be right, but exactly like 2033, this game has its fair share of visual problems. Of course, the largest of which being the stretched ass picture you've had to look at this whole time. I really have looked everywhere for some kind of fix for this thing, but if anyone other than me suffers from this specific issue, they really aren't talking about it much on the internet. Like I said at the start of the video, I have to assume the game is just trying to stretch itself to my ultra wide panel's native resolution of 3440 by 1440 instead of the resolution I set the game to, which is 2560 by 1440. And then for some reason, the game tries to keep the viewable real estate of 1440p so the picture looks like it's been squished horizontally. And believe me, I am just as unhappy with that as you are. And the worst part is it's not even consistently squished. The 2D overlays and transparent meshes that are used a few times throughout the game to simulate a full screen sort of in your face effect are pinched even further than 3D assets making their borders visible along the edge of the screen. This totally killed any effect they may have had before and it really bothered me. The good news is you likely will never have to worry about this problem if you use a traditional 16x9 monitor, and that is if it's not just localized to my setup. Other than that, I noticed a lot of texture pop in and weird issues where sometimes the game would forget to load in high-res versions of a texture and I'd be stuck looking at a blurry wall or something. Plus, this lighting issue that was not only present in 2033 but Stalker as well. I'm not really sure what to call this, maybe banding and shadows, but I figure it has to do with shadow magic resolution issues or something like that. I also noticed that at certain distances animated objects get way fewer frames of animation. The first time I was ever really aware of this trick was the release of RE2 and RE3 Remake, but it's kinda cool seeing it here if you're a dork like me. Even though performance was really consistent for me, I did have a few stutters where I'd lose a good 20% of my frame rate for seemingly no reason. The strange thing being, it wouldn't occur in the obvious spots like a huge room filled with NPCs, but in smaller, less impressive areas like the one in this cutscene. Sadly, the problem I had with 2033 crashing to the desktop randomly persisted with Last Light, although to a much less severe degree this time. And just like the last game, changing the tessellation setting to normal and unchecking advanced physics gets rid of it almost completely. And of course, the addition of the Redux version of Last Light introduced some changes to the look, but it's nowhere near as big of a leap as it was for the previous game, which makes sense. It was Last Light's development that made up the foundation for the changes that would come with Redux anyways. And speaking of changes, I think it's about time to jump into some ports. Last Light saw release on one more platform than 2033 did, and I feel like that's probably a good place to start. I'm gonna count to three. One. Glory to the red line! Two. Long live Comrade Muffin! Three. The OG, non-Redux release of Last Light dropped on the PS3 the same day as its 360 and PC counterparts. It outputs a 720p picture no matter what resolution you set the console to and targets a 30 frame per second frame rate, a target that it does not achieve very often, let me assure you. It was not uncommon for me to see dips below 20 frames per second when things got even remotely busy on screen, and yes, that can have a major effect on how smooth the game feels. Luckily, the auto-aim seems fairly strong, which can make up for that, but even the mutants in the first encounter were really kicking my ass. On the plus side, the video output is overly soft, which is normally a bad thing, but it also results in no noticeable aliasing, which also means the pre-rendered cutscenes look a little more appealing here than they do being stretched to 1440p on PC. Once again, I very much doubt anyone out there is going to use this video to decide whether or not to buy an outdated version of a game that's more readily available on more modern hardware, but at the very least, all of this dumb knowledge is now in your head too. Whoa, that's impressive. Up next, we have a much better fairing with the PS4 port of Last Light Redux, which was released just a year after the PS3 version we just covered and manages to perform so much better. This version outputs a native 1080p picture and targets 60 frames per second. I hear the Xbox One version can only upscale an internal 900p, but I can't really test that right now, so I just have to assume the internet's right on that one. And I am very pleased to say this game runs almost exactly as smooth as the same PS4 port of 2033 Redux with a mostly unwavering 60fps. 
you're definitely going to see drops here or there, and there were more of them than 2033's PS4 port, but this was still a 99.9% .9 smooth experience. There are less flashy lighting effects in some scenarios, but you really have to strain your eyes to spot them. Fog effects also got dialed back just a bit, but for both scenarios, the bulk of the effects are still there most of the time, so there's no need worrying you'll be playing a noticeably inferior port of the game. And speaking of playing, as you'd expect, that 60 frame per second lock makes for some amazingly solid shooting. I had no issues hitting my targets, and the entire game just seemed to flow so damn well after coming from that PS3 port. During gameplay, I did notice some texture pop in, but no more than I'd think you'd find in the PC release, so we'll cut it slack on that one. Just like on PS3, the CG cutscenes look a little smoother here with a lower resolution, but for some weird reason, they have letterboxing at the top and bottom. I went back and checked, and that is definitely not a thing on any of the other ports I tested. I really couldn't say why they would letterbox a video file that was already 16x9 and ran without letterboxing on every other release, but I don't think anyone could call that a downside. Interesting to note, sure, but definitely not anything to get annoyed with. As far as I see it, this is the one to grab today if you don't have a PC up to running last light. It plays so damn well and runs smoother than a lot of games being released today. Of course, the Xbox One port is a fine choice too, but if you can, go for the version with 180 extra vertical pixels of resolution. With looking at my ass, it's way out of your reach, rabbit. Up next, we have the most recent release of Last Light, its 2020 Switch port. This version outputs at an internal rendered resolution of 720p no matter what you set the console to output, but much like 2033, makes use of dynamic resolution changing to keep it performing at its 30fps target. Once again, when this technique is being viewed on a big TV while the Switch is docked, it is very noticeable. When the game reduces the internal render resolution, you can get these blurry, soft-looking pixels on the borders of 3D objects, which normally would be a huge red flag for me, but there are two things keeping me from caring this time. Number one, this is 100% worth putting up with for the chance to play one of the rare Nintendo Switch releases that can actually hold a steady frame rate. And two, you're not going to really be able to spot this on the Switch's screen in portable mode when you're looking at it at a normal distance away from your face. And really, I think the portable aspect plays the biggest role of all. Load times here are definitely going to be worse than any other version of the game, but really they're nowhere near bad enough to count against it, just something you'll notice. On an interesting note, I found that the outdoor section seemed to limit the game's draw distance when the hardware starts to get stressed a little too much, but I really had to look for that one. Oh, and here's something really odd I noticed. Our team's watch and redux looks like this, right? Well, for some reason, none of the console ports use that one. Both Redux versions on PS4 and Switch use the original design for his watch that could be found in the OG release of Last Light, and I can't for the life of me figure out why. Watches aside, though, this is a much more complete version of Last Light than anyone could have ever expected on a mobile platform like the Switch. Hell, even the jiggle physics made it into this port, and at the end of the day, isn't that what really matters? Well, it's safe to say Last Light has seen its fair share of really great ports, aside from the PS3 and 360 versions, which, to be fair, are essentially obsolete at this point. I would definitely say stick to the last-gen releases for the best experience, but I find myself being drawn in more and more to the idea of a portable Metro playthrough. Regardless of the platform, though, this is one hell of a looker. I may not have been quite so impressed with this release thanks to factors far outside of its control, but it's still an amazing looking game for something that's nearing its 8th birthday. In fact, minus the facial animations looking a little behind the times, I think you could put this in front of someone and convince them it's a modern title with no problem whatsoever. In a lot of ways, it is a massive improvement over its predecessor, and sure, maybe I would have liked to have seen that old 2033 lighting engine at work here, but I don't think you could rightly call what's on offer here a downgrade because of that. Metro Last Light has an astonishing level of visual fidelity for something as old as it is, and also continues that unique look that 2033 brought into existence. Really, it's a total win. There are no downsides I can think of here, minus the squished aspect ratio that I'm not even sure exists outside of my own computer, but hey, you know what they say. There's no power without blood! Well, it's probably not hard to tell, but I really love Metro Last Light. 
It brings back so much of what I enjoyed about 2033, and the increased emphasis on stealth just puts an extra cherry on top. That being said, I can't deny at least some portion of the game's detractors might have a point. There is a lot here that does seem to flirt with those Call of Duty vibes, and that might be a deal breaker for someone looking for a game that's going to buck that trend instead of playing into it. Like I already said, it could go either way for me. You could convince me these changes and additional set pieces were put in place specifically to court a larger section of the gaming population, but I feel like there's an even chance that they just did that because they genuinely wanted to make their video game more fun. In my opinion, the larger action focus and increased pace doesn't hurt the game necessarily, but as a fan of the Resident Evil series, I can totally sympathize with the fear that your favorite franchise is losing some of what made you fall in love with it in the first place. And if we continue that analogy, I would say Metro Last Light would be the RE3 of the series. It still stays true to the backbone of the experience established in the games before, but does so while throwing a bunch of explosions and shit at you. Contrived analogies aside, Last Light is a very definite recommendation from me. It gives you yet another chance to explore more of this dingy, just barely hanging on by a thread world, and that's always going to be the biggest draw for me. So yeah, a big thumbs up to 4A's second shot at the AAA sector. It is one hell of a time and more than deserving of a spot on your shelf. Next up on the list is a game that strays so far from the Metro formula that it retroactively makes Last Light look like a remake of the first game. Will that finally be the straw that breaks the camel's back and forces me to get mad at this series? Well, I guess we'll find out soon, but until then, stay safe, stalkers. Damn it, you bitch! <laughs> 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 Yo, what's up guys? Big thanks for sticking around till the end. Since you are here, it must mean there's something about this video you enjoyed, and if that is indeed the case, I'll have some stuff you'll probably also get into linked here on screen. Alongside my Patreon, which is a fun little invention that lets me work on YouTube content stress-free without finally giving up and just starting a drama slash commentary channel. And with that, I think it's about time for me to get my weekly four and a half hours of sleep, and then it's back to work. So have a good one and I will see all of you again later.